Celebrating 42 seasons on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, state governors band together in the wake of historic flooding, but the threat's not over yet. Trade front and center in the minds of many as USMCA tariff relief stalls, but some say a China deal may be near. The government's new leader in food safety tells students she's on a mission to protect America. And despite renewed interest in green energy, time may be running out for wind power budget help. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Mike Russell. Thanks so much for being with us today on Farm Week. Around the country and especially in the Midwest, hit by last month's floods, there's no end in sight. Communities hard hit are still sorting through what's left. Damage tops more than $2 billion in Iowa alone. Meanwhile, with more flooding likely on the way, government officials are making plans for what's next. While the flooded Missouri River continues to block roads and inundate farmland, the plans for repairs to dikes has begun, and long-term questions are being asked. The governors of Missouri, Nebraska, and Iowa met in Council Bluffs, Iowa this week and pledged to work as a team when the U.S. Corps of Engineers begins repairing flood damage. The group also plans to keep the team together as they join the Corps to look at strategies for preventing future floods. We're going to be working together uh, as neighbor states to try to figure out how we move forward and what are the things that we can do to change. But one thing is evident, something needs to change. We can't do the same old thing we've been doing and we just can't meet about it. We've got to focus on doing something. Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds called for the Corps to shift their focus away from general river management and return flood prevention to the top of their priority list. But the number one priority needs to be flood management and people. And so as we look for managing the river, those are some of the things that that's what they should be focusing on. Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts believes the permitting process to repair damaged dikes needs to be streamlined. But we want the court work with collaborative with court to figure out what we need to do to be able to make sure that again, this does not repeat. Forecasters expect flooding to continue along the Missouri River for the foreseeable future. USDA weather experts say a storm moving into the Corn Belt from the west could intensify flooding. Saturated, saturated fields and levees not yet repaired from the last storm won't help. Meanwhile, the U.S. continues to fight trade battles on multiple fronts. NAFTA 2.0 remains unratified, much to the frustration of producers. Here at home, many are urging the president to lift tariffs on our North American trading partners. At the same time, it appears a China deal may be close. Paul Yeager has more. The president's threat to shut down the border crossing with Mexico on immigration spilled over into trade relations between the two countries. Several U.S. producers rely on the nation's number three trading partner for a good share of their business. For U.S. dairy producers, Mexico is their largest export market. The USMCA, the president's answer to NAFTA, was agreed to in principle back in September. So far, none of the players have ratified the deal. Senator Charles Grassley said this week he met with the president last week to, again, make the case for lifting sanctions against USMCA countries in an effort to get a deal done. He said that he put them on, those tariffs on, so Mexico and Canada would negotiate. Well, Canada... Canada and Mexico negotiated. Even the president says he has a good trade agreement. So guess what? I say, since they negotiated in good faith, don't you think you should take the tariffs off? He said no. U.S. trade representatives spent last week in China, and this week their counterparts came stateside, working out issues of intellectual property, agriculture, and the enforcement of trade agreement terms. Thank you very much. Thank you. The vice premier of China met with the president in the White House Thursday afternoon in an effort to help end the trade stalemate between the two countries. I think it's very important. Uh, we'll see if, if it happens. Uh, we've never done a deal like this with China. Uh, and uh, it's a very unique set of circumstances. But it's a massive deal. Could be one of the 
I guess it is if you think about it, the biggest deal ever made. Also in China last week, a delegation led by the Iowa Soybean Association. Tim Bardole, a fifth generation producer from central Iowa, was on the trip and said the Chinese people he talked to last week are interested in making a deal that would allow U.S. soybeans into their country. It was unanimous on both sides of the table in every meeting. We got to get this fixed because uh, we as U.S. farmers want to be doing business with them. And they made it very clear that um, China wants to do business with us. The talks between the two nations are expected to fill the rest of April. In other news, the U.S. Department of Agriculture recently welcomed a new leader in food safety. As a former professor of food science and public health, Dr. Mindy Brashears says it's her personal mission to change the face of food inspection using science. FarmWeek's Amy Myers has that story. We all know that foodborne pathogens such as salmonella, E. coli 0157H7, listeria, those are in the media all, of, all the time. You hear about outbreaks, recalls, and I've taken it very personally as my mission to prevent those illnesses from occurring. As Deputy Undersecretary, Brashears will lead the USDA's Food Safety Inspection Service, whose mission is to protect public health. This involves preventing foodborne illness, modernizing inspection systems, and achieving operational excellence. Dr. Brashear says one of the main ways to do that is using science. Formerly, food safety involved visual inspection of products, but now FSIS is using scientific, data-driven methods. We are moving to whole genome sequencing. And uh, whole genome sequencing of bacterial strains, we're using that to trace back recalls. So we may have a recall. You know, the CDC starts seeing a pattern they know it's associated with uh, some particular product. And then we start comparing our, uh, the findings that we have and, and looking at what the consumers are, uh, have eaten and how they've handled that product. And then we can actually identify where our recalls are coming from. Dr. Brashear's message really seemed to resonate with students, creating a new understanding of food safety and exciting careers it offers. I find it interesting because Yes, we don't realize how much safety and protocol has gone into our foods and regulations since you have so many diseases that could easily get into the meat. Now that I have listened to her talk, it has actually opened up a wide chain of webs in my head. Now that knowing there's a more female minority based in the USDA, I might just want to go into the USDA branch. The world population is steadily increasing. Hence, the need for larger food supply that is, of course, safe. Dr. Brashears says she looks forward to helping the USDA achieve that goal on a national and international level. I'm Amy Myers, reporting. The USDA admits the food landscape in the U.S. is changing and is involved in managing those changes related to food processing and food distribution. Brashears is an expert in food safety. She is also past chair of the National Alliance for Food Safety and Security. It is a classic plant, a favorite bedding flower of gardeners for more than 100 years. But geraniums don't have to feel out of date. Here's Gary with a current variety. And the message, your granny didn't grow these. Some gardeners think that geraniums are old-fashioned flowering plants. Today, Southern Gardening is at Rivers Greenhouse and Garden, and these plants are certainly not your grandma's geraniums. Calliope is one of the best and most versatile geraniums available, and it's suited for baskets and containers. These plants have a vigorous semi-trailing and strong branching growth habit and semi-double flowers. Calliope is an interspecific hybrid, a cross between upright zonal and trailing ivy geraniums. Red is by far the most popular color, and Calliope medium dark red doesn't disappoint. This selection has outstanding flower color and is a rich, deep, velvety red. But calliope geraniums don't stop with traditional red. They come in a wide range of colors. Medium white pops with its pure white flowers. 
Large Rose Mega Splash Bicolor has intense pink petals that are splashed with a deeper red-pink eye. Medium Pink Flame Bicolor has large light pink flowers with hot pink eyes. Geraniums like lots of sun and are heat and drought tolerant. Always plant geraniums in well-drained potting mix and only water when the mix is dry to the touch. Be careful not to overwater because geraniums don't like wet feet. Feed twice a month with water-soluble fertilizer and don't forget to deadhead for the best flowering performance. Calliope, like all geraniums, look great in containers, combination plantings, and hanging baskets. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. A plant that can tolerate both heat and drought sounds perfect for Mid-South summers, but for now, as we showed you earlier, it's not drought but flooding that's the issue, including parts of the Mississippi Delta. That's right, Mike, and across the Mississippi River out in the Midwest, lots of calves have actually been killed by floodwaters. We'll have an update on that in a moment. Also in the markets this week, more cattle than expected go into the nation's feedlots. In the hog trade, it's all about China. While a cheaper dollar would help give some excitement to corn prices. There are different opinions about exactly how many calves have been lost to floodwaters in the United States so far this spring. Trader Naomi Bloom says any negative repercussions from this death loss may not really be known until the fourth quarter of this year or later. What the market is mostly focused though on right now is the reality that there's plenty of production, there's plenty of supply. We've got second quarter production expected to be higher, uh, 420 million pounds higher. And so there's, there's not an issue of, of product right now for the, the short term. Coming down the road, that might be something different with, with the death loss that's there. Um, but I'm curious to see is if the box beef values can hang in there and if um, the choice product is going to be there or not. Because some are thinking that with the, the winter that we've had that the choice product is not going to be there. So maybe we see that marketplace stay higher and keep cattle supportive. Um, bottom line, cattle continue to be in an uptrend. We could even drop another two or three bucks and still be in a long-term uptrend. Um, but it's the deferred contracts that I'm, I'm very curious in the, in the months ahead once we get a better handle on what actually has happened because of the flooding and the loss. Meanwhile, the latest cattle on feed report indicates that placements of adult livestock into feedlots is on the upswing. Extension's Josh Maple says that's a big story because domestic demand for beef usually weakens until full-on grilling season gets going. He explains it like this. This month in particular, we saw a 2% increase in placements, uh, which was more than, than most analysts were expecting going into the report. I think the average expectations was far a little bit lower than a year ago, and we actually saw an increase. Uh, so some more cattle placed than were expected. Uh, if you shake, work out the numbers, we had a little bit larger marketings uh, compared to last year. Uh, the total on feed number at 11.8 million head of cattle in feedlots. Uh, this is up about 1% from a year ago, so continued uh, more cattle on feed than we had the previous year, which has been the story for us for a while now. Trader Ted Seifried says he thinks the cattle sector may be due for a price correction as we move towards the middle of April. Ted seems to think some external factors have slightly inflated beef prices. He explains it this way. I think the, the strength in the hogs and the weather has kept cattle up a little bit longer than maybe it should, but we've already started to see cash slide a little bit. I think we're due for a bit more of a correction in cattle. Longer term, I'm still really bullish for protein in the United States uh, because I think we're going to be competing with China for our own product. But, yeah, I think now is the time for a bit more of a pullback there for the cattle. In the hog market, some upward price movement in the U.S. in recent weeks combined with projections of growing Chinese imports are fueling some excitement. Analyst Don Ruse says many factors are at play, but in this reality, this market and what's happening is all about China. It's just a series of events. We had uh, hog prices went way too low just recently because China was liquidating their herd and uh, putting that in, uh, those supplies into the pipeline. Then it just did a 180. A week ago, uh, hog, uh, pig prices jumped $10, uh, $10 uh, 10% over in uh, China. That really was the start of it. And um, then we did have uh, 
on our export sales. China bought 50% of our exports. And uh, their breeding herd looks like it's down somewhere around 19%. Mm-hmm. Their overall supply is down 16%. So does that equate to big buying in the U.S.? The market voted that it does, but we'll see. This week's trivia quiz on Farm Week focuses on another white meat. And here's the question. What chicken appetizer do U.S. consumers prefer the most? Is the answer A, wings, B, chicken nuggets, C, chicken strips, or D, popcorn chicken? We'll have that answer coming up shortly. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, wind power, one of the most visible and up until now, one of the most steadily growing forms of renewable energy. The number of whirling blades has spread across the nation and even offshore with the help of tax credits. Now though, time could be running out on that kind of help. The wind industry may have to leverage itself in other ways. Next time on Farm Week. Don't go away, we'll be right back. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Never carry more than one person on a single rider four-wheeler. The four-wheeler can become unstable and very dangerous. ATVs are designed for off-road use only. Never drive one on a highway or any other paved surface. And always ride the right size machine at the right speed. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. Before we get back to the market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, on Thursday, April 25th, the 66th Southern Hardwood Forest Research Group Annual Meeting. It's from 8 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. at the CAP Center at the Delta Branch Experiment Station in Stoneville. This year's theme, Threats to the Bottomland Hardwoods Resource. Topics include invasive plant species, chronic wasting disease, and much more. Registration is $25. For information, call Crystal Nelson at 662-336-4800. Next on Tuesday, April 30th at the Thad Cochran Research Center at MSU in Starkville, an event for ag producers making land use decisions, a program balancing farm success with oil and gas growth. Topics include financial impact, legal obligations, environmental strategies, and more. The seminars are sponsored by the USDA and the Southern Extension Risk Management Education Center. For information, call Rachel Carter at 662-325-3141. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. We move into row crops for the second half of our markets. We begin with corn. Economists and traders, for the most part, believe the upside for this grain is still pretty limited. Dan Huber thinks a weaker dollar and some type of weather issue will help move the corn market in the right direction. There's going to have to be a combination of two factors moving forward. Uh, Once we get beyond, let's say, the end of March, when we get the acreage numbers out there, one is we're going to need to have a weather issue. And I think probably even beyond that, I think even with a weather issue, unless we see the dollar turn lower, and I think the probability is decent that it will, but until we see that dollar turn lower, we really are not going to get the commodity markets or at least the A commodity markets excited. Meanwhile, there is some momentum in the cotton market. Economist O.A. Cleveland says there are several bullish factors lining up now for this trade. He notes that prices have moved higher since the recent projection of reduced U.S. plantings this year. There are also signals of an end of the trade tensions between the U.S. and China. And Cleveland finds evidence of a resurgence in some export sales of U.S. cotton. We wrap up our markets with a look back at the trivia quiz for the week. A recent consumer survey asked the question, what chicken appetizer do you prefer the most? The answer is C, chicken strips. But a very, very close second was chicken wings. If you've driven the country at all, you have probably seen these wind turbines atop towers hundreds of feet tall. They're a common sight, especially at wind farms in Texas, Southern California, and the Midwest. Wind power has been growing, but now time is running out to take advantage of government assistance for the wind industry. 
The number of whirling blades scraping Midwestern skies has grown steadily across the nation's midsection in recent decades. That growth may soon have to contend with the loss of a primary building block, the energy production tax credit. In the early 1990s, the tax deferred program passed through Congress, helping stabilize and expand the use of renewable energy. The credits helped companies like Iowa-based MidAmerican Energy to begin investing heavily in wind energy production. In 2016, nearly half of the power provided to customers was produced by wind turbines. The company plans on achieving a goal of having 100% of their power portfolio be renewable by 2021. Those same tax credits spurred growth in the industry and helped wind power producers update aging infrastructure without having to pass the cost along to customers. But the repowering process is, is essentially a uh, opportunity for us to go ahead and put uh, more efficient equipment on existing assets that we already own. Down, another foot, John. But as we look at the project, uh, the real benefit for our customers is that we're going to get about a million megawatt hours a year of additional energy out of these existing projects. By upgrading the equipment on over 700 existing towers, the company is increasing the amount of energy it captures while maintaining as small an economic footprint as possible. On days like today where the wind's a little bit lower, the turbines cut in a little sooner, we get a little more energy at lower wind conditions, and uh, that really helps us pick up more energy from existing assets. MidAmerican, like other wind energy providers, is working on a tight timetable. With passage of the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018, wind energy businesses may be witness to the curtain call for energy production tax credits. Wind energy projects starting construction by December of 2019 are eligible for the full credit. Projects starting after 2019 will see the credit shrink by 20% per year until the program expires in 2022. Those companies working to expand their production capacity also face hurdles in communities where the towers are being erected. Some landowners charge that site and noise pollution hurts property values as well as creating a potential health risk. Environmental groups contend that turbines are a threat to bats and birds. However, according to U.S. Fish and Wildlife data, the number of birds killed by buildings is 1,500 times greater than the number of birds killed by wind turbines. Further, a 2014 National Institutes of Health study revealed noise and visual complaints had more to do with who was receiving economic benefit from nearby wind farms. And three university studies showed wind farms had no impact on housing prices. A half hour ferry ride off the coast of Rhode Island stands the nation's first offshore wind farm. Constructed by Deepwater Wind, the Block Island Wind Farm began construction in 2015 and went online in 2016 with a price tag of almost $300 million. For the 1,000 plus year round residents of Block Island, the towers brought stability to an otherwise uncertain electrical infrastructure. We came across Block Island for a few reasons. Uh, one, uh, the island had this really urgent energy need. Uh, they had old diesel generators that they were looking to replace, uh, but were struggling to find a solution. And at the same time, the state, the larger state of Rhode Island, was looking to be a pioneer in offshore wind energy. So it was a perfect marriage. Offshore wind turbines dwarf their inland counterparts. At the tip of the blade, Block Island turbines stand at just over 600 feet, as opposed to the standard 270 feet found across the Midwest. And so the further offshore you get, the stronger the wind tends to be. And the further offshore you get, fewer people can see them. So you reduce the potential, you know, negative uh, or potential skepticism of these projects by putting them out of sight. The offshore wind industry faces some of the same hurdles as onshore producers. The same tax credits helping advance the industry technologically will gradually fade away, increasing costs for future projects. Deepwater Wind also has contended with objections from some fishermen and mariners who claim the company is infringed on fishing grounds and damaged equipment. We have to work in our industry, the offshore wind industry, with commercial fishermen to make sure that we can all coexist out there. 
Uh, it's a big ocean, and um, there are ways that the two industries can work together. But we have to be sensitive to the fact that we've got an existing industry out there that's used to using the ocean. So that is the real challenge, is we're new neighbors out in the ocean, and we have to learn how to work together. The work by companies like Deepwater Wind has gained some attention by officials in Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, where land is at a premium. That combination of having this big, dense coastal population really close to a huge offshore resource is the magic behind our business, and it's the reason why we think offshore wind will be such a big thing in the U.S. That was John Torpy reporting. Wind farms, amazing to look at, and they make a lot of environmental sense. And a lot of economic sense, too, Mike. And I understand that wind energy typically costs about a nickel per kilowatt hour. The average consumer, though, pays about 12 cents. Now, next week on Farm Week, another unique story for you. You wouldn't necessarily think of jail inmates as gardeners. After all, as the saying goes, when you do the crime, you've got to do the time. But at one facility, inmates are given a chance to learn something new behind that razor wire, and what they learn may be good not only for them, but for the rest of society as well. That's next time on Farm Week. And as always, if you miss a story, look for the past episodes of Farm Week on our website. That's farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.